uh, and welcome uh, to today's event. Uh, my name is Wilson Pritchard. Uh, I'm the CEO of the International Center for Tax and Development, uh, and I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to today's uh, very exciting event. Um, and let me really emphasize up front that I think that today's event uh, really will be very important uh, and very exciting. Uh, and I think quite a, a unique contribution to the broader debate around international taxation and international tax reform around the world. Uh, so let me be correspondingly brief so that we can get quickly into the discussion. Uh, let me start say just a very brief word about the ICTD and its mission for those who may not be familiar uh, with the organization. Uh, founded in 2010, the ICTD was created to support the expansion of research into the challenge of building more effective, equitable and accountable tax systems uh, across the full range of taxes in low-income countries and particularly in Africa. Uh, we brought to that task a focus on practically relevant and interdisciplinary research that responds to the concrete needs and priorities of partners in lower-income countries uh, and a commitment to working closely with partners from the Global South in developing new knowledge and seeking to shape tax debates locally, nationally and internationally and in particular with uh, revenue officials and ministries of finance around the world. Uh, work on international taxation emerged early on as a key area of focus for those efforts rooted in concern that existing international rules were not working for low-income countries um, and that those country, same countries often had a limited voice in shaping those international tax debates. Today's event will feature a really terrific example of that work and that broader commitment. The event today is going to be organized in two broad parts. First, a presentation and discussion of ICTD's new research on lower income countries experiences participating in global tax negotiations and some of the challenges that they encounter. The second part of the event will then be a panel of current and former negotiators from three continents around the world who will reflect on how to strengthen lower income countries participation and influence in global negotiations in hopes of supporting outcomes that better reflect the needs and priorities of those countries. The panel will be moderated by Stephanie Soon Johnston the chief correspondent at Tax Notes International. And so let me just take a moment uh, to extend a very, very warm welcome and thanks uh, to our moderator and to our panelists. Uh, I really do feel enormously privileged to have all of you with us to discuss these important questions today. Uh, before passing over uh, to Martin Hearson, who will then direct the first part of the session, let me just briefly note a few practical matters. Uh, first, uh, translation of the event is available in English, Spanish and French. Uh, if you haven't yet figured that out, but you can understand what I'm saying, uh, please look for the translation button in Zoom. Uh, and a big thank you to our translators based in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, second, if you would like to post questions or make comments, please do so using the Q&A function, not the chat function. So that is, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, and we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as possible. If, by contrast, you're having any technical issues, please use the chat function and someone from the ICTD will reply directly to you to try to help. Finally, uh, note that the event is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. So if you like what you hear, uh, which I'm sure that you will, please share widely. Uh, we'll now begin the first part of the program. So let me quickly hand over to our international tax program lead, Martin Hearson. Thanks very much, Will. So thanks very much to everybody who's attending this event. Let me start by signaling a few points about the presentation that I'm going to give. Um, the first is that this uh, research was a team effort. You're going to hear from Tofani and myself, but the third member of the team was Rasmus Christensen, who is currently on paternity leave. Um, but he probably did the most work on the project, so it's a shame he can't join us. The second is uh, that for this presentation, we're going to alternate between myself in English and Tofani in French. So if you want to listen to it all in English, you should switch to the English language feed now. Finally, the report's available to download now on the ICTD website in English and French. So here's an outline of what I'll be talking about. I'll go through the background and the research approach. Tovenir will cover the third section, how decisions are taken in the IF. Um, I'll present the fourth section on types of influence and then Tovenir will conclude. So first, the background and motivation of the research. So this is a lecture slide that uh, I often use with some of my students to explain what's happened in international tax. So here you see a meeting uh, from around 2012 uh, containing only OECD members. So this is largely how tax decision making at the OECD looked prior to 2013. 
Here you see a recent meeting of the inclusive framework. It's a room so large that as one participant said to us in the interviews, you can't read the name cards on the people facing you. Now the IF is portrayed in quite a polarized way. Official statements typically emphasize that it's a level playing field and that every decision is a consensus of its full membership. In contrast, there are some messages from civil society organizations and, and ATAF, for example, which sometimes give the impression that lower income countries are little more than passengers in a vehicle being driven by the OECD and the G20. Now, issues of unequal participation are not unique either to the inclusive framework or to taxation. We also know that there's a considerable effort to support lower income countries to participate in the IF, led by the OECD Secretariat itself. So our aim here was to study the experiences of lower income countries in practice from an independent viewpoint. I, sh I should also add that our focus is on how to improve the effectiveness of existing institutions. We excluded from our terms of reference the question of whether the inclusive framework is a good thing or whether it should be superseded by an intergovernmental tax body at the UN. Although inevitably our analysis will touch on the question of what type of institution is best suited to particular ends. Just a note about terminology. We're using the term lower income countries in a specific way here. And that's to refer to countries that fall into the low and lower middle income bracket. But we're treating G20 members separately. Even within what remains the lower income country group, there are very different situations and experiences. But we wanted at least to draw conclusions about less powerful economies rather than about large and influential emerging markets such as China, India, or Brazil. So let me say a few words now about the way we approach the research. We were lucky to be able to speak to a broad cross-section of people with experience of IF negotiations for our interviews, as well as observers and commentators from the outside. In addition to that, we benefited from data on meeting attendance, attendance provided to us by the OECD Secretariat. We wanted to make our analysis as specific as possible, so we started by identifying case studies of specific policy decisions that we could study. We got these from published documents that made claims about developing country influence, as well as from the initial scoping interviews. By cross-referencing that with the public timeline for these decisions and the attendance data, we were able to use interviews to ask people about specific decision points for which we knew they'd been in the room. And the approach we used here is process tracing, which sets a high bar in terms of the evidence required. We were looking for positive evidence that particular outcomes were different because of the actions of lower income countries. To help us with the conceptual side, we also reviewed literature on global economic governance in other areas, most of which tends to focus on the World Trade Organization. So here are the case studies that we looked at. We're able to gain enough evidence to reach a view for seven cases at the inclusive framework and one for comparison at the UN Tax Committee. In this table, you'll see that three of them are written in grayed out uh, text because they're not discussed in the working paper. But I'm happy to talk about them later if there are any questions. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to Tovani, who will present on the next section. The first part of our research addressed the question, how are decisions taken in the inclusive framework? The first thing to know is that the inclusive framework has a three-level structure. This is composed of the plenary, which is the official decision-making body of the IF. Plenary meetings bring together senior tax officials from the 137 member jurisdictions, alongside observers from regional and international organizations. Next, the steering group's role is to orientate the necessary technical work conducted in the working parties. It is the site of the most intense negotiations. It comprises of 24 people, half of them from OECD member states and half from other countries. Finally, the working parties conduct technical work under the direction of the steering group. These technical bodies are officially open to representatives from all IF member states. They generally include 40 to 60 experts and meet two to four times per year. This structure suggests that the plenary is the main focus of decision making. This is correct in theory, but many people we interviewed describe the plenary meetings as choreographed. It is a room of approval where everything has been well prepared and orchestrated. The sauce has been made, the dish is served. If you say that the salt is missing, you want to add something, they will tell you that the dish is done. It is at the steering group level that the dish is prepared. We can perhaps clarify that politically difficult decisions are taken in the plenary, especially on the taxation of the digital economy, but in general the way of working is to prepare decisions in advance as much as possible. 
Steering group members are nominated by states and are formally elected by the IF members, but they participate in a personal capacity. The election of steering group members is strongly influenced by the OECD Secretariat, which identifies capable and influential people as well as assuring a geographical balance. If we compare the IF steering group with the UN Tax Committee, we can see certain similarities. Both are groups of around 25 members, half from OECD member states and half from other countries participating in a personal capacity. But there are important differences. First, the IF works on the basis of consensus, while the UN Committee can take majority decisions. Second, the OECD Secretariat is vastly better resourced than the UN Tax Committee. The former employs over 100 specialists across its tax work, although this capacity does not all support the IF directly, whereas the latter has only a handful of experts on staff. This chart shows the growth in official participation by non-member states of the OECD in OECD decision making. It has increased tenfold from 2013 to 2019. Non-OECD members now outnumber OECD members by almost three to one. This table shows that participation in practice is very unequal, especially in the working groups, where we see that non-OECD countries represent less than 25% of attendees, despite making up almost 75% of IF membership. In 2019, only 5.4% of working party attendees represented lower income countries. Further disaggregating the distribution of working party participation reveals highly skewed attendance among non-OECD countries. Out of 100 non-OECD IF members, 70 did not attend a single working party meeting during 2019. Among attendees, participation was heavily dominated by large emerging economies in Asia. For the steering group, at the start of 2020, three of its 24 members, 12.5%, came from lower income countries. The feedback from interviews on the involvement of lower income countries' representatives in meetings is quite mixed. Comments from interviewees concerning the effectiveness of non-OECD steering group members were broadly consistent. Some were frequently cited as productive negotiators, while others failed to speak up. Three factors explain this low level of participation. First, the well-documented structural obstacles not unique to the IF, such as constraints on technical capacity and resources. These are exacerbated by some aspects of the OECD's decision-making processes, such as the costs of attending regular meetings in Paris and the absence of routine and timely translation of documents and meetings. This can make the OECD a daunting environment for member state delegates, but especially for those from lower income countries. In addition, many have joined with no intention of influencing standards, but rather in pursuit of technical assistance or prestige or under coercion from the European Union. For example, one interview stated, I've never experienced a feeling of not being allowed to express my views. I freely express my views and I get the feeling that they are heard, but I don't expect to have any influence ultimately when decisions are made. This quote brings us the following observations. Having a seat at the table does not guarantee meaningful influence over tax negotiations. In other words, the number of countries attending or speaking is not a reliable indicator of the extent of meaningful influence. Nonetheless, our case studies give reasons to be optimistic. The interests of lower income countries have been taken into account in IF negotiations in spite of the small number of active participants, thanks to the effectiveness of some key individuals. So now I'm going to talk through the four types of influence that we identified. So these are types of influence categories that we came up with that demonstrate ways in which decisions taken inside the BEPS project, the inclusive framework and the UN tax committee have been taken that serve the interests of lower income countries. So this table gives an overview of those four mechanisms. They can be grouped according to um, the principal level of analysis. So two of them relate to the actions of at state level and two of them actions taken by individual negotiators. Within those broad themes, we've identified different mechanisms depending on whether low income countries themselves were actively implicated in the decisions taken or were largely passive. So in the first two mechanisms, that's association and anticipation, they appear on the, the right hand side of the table. Low income countries are not strongly implicated. There's largely other actors who identified and advocated for certain positions. 
in the two other mechanisms, that's collaboration and individual authority, lower income countries and their representatives were among the actors who developed and promoted certain reforms. A prerequisite for these latter two mechanisms is strong technical, political and diplomatic capacity. So I'm now going to talk through each mechanism one by one and just mention the case studies that we identified that illustrated the, those mechanisms. So first, association. This is a dynamic whereby lower income countries benefit from the positions advanced by large, more powerful countries without actively mobilizing themselves. Association was particularly prevalent in the BEPS era prior to the creation of the inclusive framework when lower income countries didn't have a formal standing at the OECD. So the SIX method is the best example of this kind of change. The SIX method is a simplified method to determine transfer pricing for primary commodities. It was promoted at the OECD by a Latin American coalition supported by other resource rich emerging markets in the context of BEPS Action 10. A large diplomatic effort was required and was supported by ATAF according to some interviewees but it was opposed by higher, higher income countries led by the US. A compromise was eventually adopted in the OECD's transfer pricing guidelines, but that compromise hasn't been widely adopted by lower income countries in their legislation. ATAF has integrated it into its model transfer pricing legislation and countries such as Argentina have adopted it. Argentina had to amend its own existing six method to align with the OECD approach. It's important to note that the practice uh, the practice embodied by the SIX method is commonly used in Africa, even if it rarely appears in countries' legislation. So some interviewees from lower income countries considered it was a success to have it included in the OECD guidelines, insofar it, was a, it gave them the benefit of that recognition by the OECD. So in some, association can be an important mechanism for lower income countries in the short term. But over the long term, a reliance on this approach leaves lower income countries vulnerable to changes in the preferences of more powerful emerging economies. We see that, for example, in the way that China has begun depart departing from its historical alignment with lower income countries in many global tax discussions. Second, anticipation. So it's not, as its name indicates, anticipation is a mechanism through which influential actors such as secretariat staff, delegates from more powerful countries and civil society organizations promote the needs and interests of lower income countries once they've determined what they think those interests are. As with association, it doesn't entail much action on the part of lower income countries themselves. So in the paper, we illustrate it through two case studies, country by country reporting, which was promoted by civil societies organizations and later by the UK government in the OECD and work on article 12 at the UN tax committee, which was driven primarily by members from OECD countries and by the UN secretariat itself. So the effect of this, of this mechanism is mixed and we try to uh, ascertain what determines when it's effective. So in the case of country by country reporting, several interviews stated that it was of little use to lower income countries in the manner that's been adopted by the G20 and OECD. Um, few lower income countries, almost none in fact, have access to these reports today. In contrast, Article 12a adopted by the UN Tax Committee has been more of a success and you can see it adopted numerous times in the treaties signed by lower income countries. So anticipation is most effective when it's uh, clearly based on lower income countries experiences and preferences and on an existing template found in legislation or treaty practice, as was the case for Article 12a. Without that level of direct interest and involvement and in an environment requiring a consensus, it's little surprise if outcomes supposed, supposedly to the benefit of lower income countries from the inclusive framework don't actually interest them. That said, without a consensus, it's not possible to count on large economies to adopt an instrument that's been adopted, that's been endorsed purely by a majority decision. So the third mechanism is collaboration, and that's distinct from association, although it also involves coalitions of countries, in that lower income countries here are playing an active role in the coalition, even if those coalitions are bolstered by the participation of larger economies. So if you look at literature on the World Trade Organization that explores the strengths and weaknesses of different types of alliance, kind of based on two ideal types. So a long-standing political bloc and then short-term single issue coalitions. In global tax negotiations, we inevitably focus on the G24 and on ATAF, the two most visible organized coalitions. So the G24's entry into the tax domain is fairly recent. 
It was announced by the significant economic presence proposal that was put on the table at the end of 2018. The G24 strength, we argue, has, has been political, with a strong representation on the steering group of the inclusive framework and the benefit of support from several large emerging economies. So the significant economic presence proposal itself didn't become a part of the ongoing technical agenda at the inclusive framework, but it was seen by many of the, the participants who were part of the G24 as having changed the balance of negotiations in their favour. In contrast, ATAF's clearest successes have been at the level of detailed interventions, footnotes and examples in documents, which are important, but they're at that level of detail. So ATAF seemed to have leveraged a combination of its strength as a regional bloc and a concentration of technical expertise, both from its secretariat and from its member states on the cross-border taxation committee. I thought one thing that was particularly interesting that, that, we, that we heard from several people was that ATAF had succeeded in changing document wording in instances where some small OECD countries that had shared its views had not been able to do so. So there's something about the ATAF approach which had made it more successful. It's also notable that in ATAF, as with the G24, some of the most active participants are from countries that haven't joined the IF, but are able to influence it nonetheless through the membership of the coalition. So the final mechanism is individual authority. And this covers instances in which individual people from lower income countries establish sufficient personal competence and reputation that they can influence outcomes. While the size of a country's economy is always the most important determinant of its influence over negotiations, we know that for both OECD countries and lower income countries, the quality of the people they send into negotiations also matters, such that some small countries can punch above their weight and some large countries punch below it. This is even true in trade, which is a much more politicized area, according to the literature. But for the inclusive framework, it's especially important, given that steering group members are acting in a personal capacity and the Secretariat consults informally with an inner circle as it develops documents. So individual authority interacts with collaboration because coalitions can elevate the most capable negotiators further and allow, allow countries unable to commit enough human resources themselves to benefit from the actions of those individuals. In the paper, we discuss this dynamic in respect of a footnote including in, included in the guidance on the attribution of profits to permanent establishments, which ATAF members succeeded in securing in 2018. I want to mention two aspects of what makes a strong negotiator that we found particularly important. And I should say that the panel discussion later on includes people who I'm sure can talk to personal experience about this. So the first is the length of experience in negotiations to learn how to operate in the international tax environment and how to develop a, and, and to develop a reputation and the networks that you need to negotiate effectively. The second is experience in transnational settings beyond the negotiating environments at the OECD and the UN. So for example, universities or the International Fiscal Association. In the paper, we've included some quotes from people who became well known as strong negotiators in which they talk about their journeys to, to, to reaching that point in, in this way. Okay, now I'm gonna hand back to Tovani who's gonna talk about uh, our conclusions. Yeah, I'm asked to do the, the recommendations in English. So I will switch in English. Our recommendations are directed towards stakeholders, including donors, international organizations, and developing countries themselves. They could reinforce collaboration among lower income countries, resolve structural obstacles, and improve the effectiveness of expert negotiators. But to do this, it's more important to develop the quality of participation than the quantity. More concretely, Lower income countries must recognize the importance of skilled negotiators, putting in place measures to keep them in post for a sustained period of time. Donors could support this through the creation of a fund, independent of international organizations, that targets its resources to support a limited cohort to become elite negotiators, and by emphasizing diplomatic as well as technical skills. Secondly, Lower income countries, regional organizations, and donors should focus more on the soft soft collaboration to design domestic and regional reforms based on their experiences rather than on the OECD and G20 policy agendas. This could lead to proposals suitable for consideration by the inclusive framework. On the, digitaliz on the digitalization agenda, 
For example, lower income countries may benefit, may, may benefit most by learning from each other experience uh, with, uh, with, for example, digital uh, services taxes, the economic presence rules, the VAT rules uh, for e-commerce, um, and the alternative minimum taxes. ATAF's works here could be a good example to follow, but there are other examples of soft soft collaboration in SIAD and the G24, and so on. Thirdly, last but not the least, the OECD could improve its way of working to create a more inclusive framework by adapting to the reality, reality for lower income countries. The first idea is for the steering group to help lower income countries to identify the array of highest priority to them. For this, we could image a more realistic timeline for resource constraint, constraint context, sorry, greater use of online meetings, the production of summary briefs by the Secretariat, and the guarantee that documents and important meetings will be translated. In our working paper, we suggest that interventions such as inductions and pre-meetings should be timed and targeted to support the formation of positions and alliances, not simply to get delegates up to speed on the eve of meetings. Among our other recommendations, we suggest setting targets of diverse expert representation in technical policy making beyond the, uh, the inclusive uh, framework plenary, monitoring the uptake of instruments in practice rather than by high level claims about their potential, and experimenting with a mini lateral approach instead of always requiring a consensus of 137 mem members above all for the um, inclusive frameworks minimum standards. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Tovani and Martin, for that presentation. Um, you know, I've been covering the inclusive framework since it was instituted in 2016. And, you know, it's really fascinating to see it grow and uh, to see the research in your paper identify just the evolution of this very unique um, body decision-making body has been really fascinating to me. So thank you so much. And also I appreciate the uh, drawing of your research from text notes content. So um, really appreciate that. And a shameless shout out for text notes. Um, you can read my article on uh, the paper in today's edition of Text Notes Today International. So um, now I will um, to just lead both of you just want to ask you a couple questions just to follow up on your research. Um, let's see, uh, Tovani, uh, would you mind telling us uh, what are the lessons then from this research uh, for your own country, Madagascar? Um, wh what do you think um, there are the key takeaways for the research for, for your country? Thank you for your question, Stephanie. Um, we came up with various recommendations, but I think there are two points that are worth holding on to in the case of Madagascar. First, there is no substitute for investing in experienced and talented negotiators. It is important to have the right person in the right place. This means having people with strong technical, but also political and diplomatic skills as negotiators notably in international tax negotiations. But that on its own is not sufficient. We can't expect a major change to be achieved by developing countries in the inclusive framework when countries are acting alone. The point I want to make is that the best solution for lower income countries must focus on South-South collaboration. The good news here is that ATAF is already doing this and is able to bring lower income countries' positions to the table, notably on the question of digitalization. That said, I think Madagascar has to concentrate first of all on collaboration with ATAF through the Cross-Border Technical Committee to set out its own experiences and positions, but also to benefit from other countries' experiences. 
That said, it is also important for Madagascar to reflect on how it can build a cohort of expert negotiators. A first idea could be to hire negotiators with a diverse expertise, technical and policy, but also diplomatic, to ensure that the people who are to be placed in high-level negotiation roles can undertake placements in regional and international organizations and master's level study, and to above all, keep them in post for as long as possible. Um, and now for Martin, uh, may I ask, um, so there is this debate between, you know, the UN tax, the, the debate between the OECD and the UN, UN. you know, there are very, very there is a, a very strong debate, especially within the civil society circles that, you know, tax policy should be set in a global tax body such as at the UN. Um, how does your research address this debate? Thanks. So, so as I, uh, as I said at the start, we, we, we stay clear of explicitly trying to address this question. Um, but I think some of the things that came out partly because we chose to introduce a bit of a comparative study of the, the with one decision taken at the UN um, uh, with what's happened at the inclusive framework and also because many, much of what we learn um, seems to apply across the board kind of it, it points to the fact that a focus on structure on the um, on the design of institutions um, which has dominated that debate uh, might in some ways obscure what are systemic and structural problems at the level of agency. So um, uh, problems that affect um, the ability of developing countries to work in whatever structure they are. And so I think, I think one of the main things that, that came across is that um, much of what we recommend that needs to be done. So focusing on developing a, uh, the, the quality of, of representation rather than the quantity. So focusing on developing a s small cohort of uh, of uh, really effective negotiators who can represent a broader constituency um, and helping to build um, ideas and experience and sharing of, of, of experience from, from uh, on a south-south level so that that will create a platform and an agenda for change uh, in international organizations. That's, that's something which applies equally across uh, whether it's the existing UN committee or some other new body or the inclusive framework. Um, I think one of the one of the things I found quite interesting was when we realized that um, often uh, a good indicator of whether something which is agreed by a body is going to be adopted by low income countries is the extent to which it's something with which they were already familiar, something based on practice, at least in some countries where others can see its demonstrable success. Um, see, that, that explains the success of Article 12a, um, but it also explains, for example, the success of the anti-abuse clauses, which since they've been introduced through the BEPS project, uh, and now you find them in both the, the model treaties, they're now almost ubiquitous in any new treaty that's signed. So um, I think, yeah, building on what's existing, uh, building on existing experience and therefore helping to, 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 to build a platform of more existing knowledge about each other's experience among low income countries would, would be the same either way. But there is one big difference um, that came across and that's the difference between a body that is focused on, uh, a body that takes decisions on a majority basis and a body that is focused on, that has to have a consensus to reach an agreement. And they do different things. It's not that one is better or worse than another, it's that they serve a different function. If you, uh, if you insist on a, a consensus as, as the OECD inclusive framework uh, is designed to do, um, you end up with a lowest common denominator and that can be frustrating but it means that hopefully you can rely on everybody to then adopt that lowest common denominator decision. Um, uh, on the other hand, if you, if you take a decision on a majority basis, as we're seeing more and more in the UN tax committee, you get an instrument which looks more like what, what developing countries are, are pushing for, um, but there's less guarantee that other countries are going to adopt it. Now those two things serve different functions and they're not better or worse than each other, they're just different. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, I'm going to really keep an eye on the developments here. I, I hope that there is going to be a follow-up research. Uh, so, you know, more for us to read and for more for me to report on. So um, looking forward to, um, you know, your, your findings in the future, if you are going to pursue that. Um, so thank you so much again for both of you for your presentation. And again, the paper will be available on the ICTD website.
Um, so please check it out. Um, and we will uh, go back if we have questions from the audience. Um, we will go back toward the end of the event to um, try to address those as well. So hopefully we'll hear from you again. Thank you so much. Uh, so now let me let me just turn now to the second part of our event, uh, where we, I'm going to speak with several of our uh, distinguished guests who are um, who have practical experience in these in multilateral negotiations. So uh, let me um, introduce everyone first of all. Um, let me say uh, so. I want to welcome uh, Mr. Mr. Amadou Abdoulaye Badian. He is the Director of Legislation and International Cooperation at Senegal's uh, Directorate General of Taxes and Customs. Um, we have Emmanuel Eze. Uh, he is a manager in the Tax Policy um, and, and Advisory Department of Nigeria's Federal uh, Inland Revenue Service. We have uh, Kim Jacinto Harneris. Uh, she's senior advisor uh, of Albright St Stone Ridge Group. Um, she's also a former commissioner of the Bureau of Internal Revenue in the Philippines. And she's also a member of the UN Tax Committee and a commissioner for the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. Uh, we also have uh, Marlene Nemhard Parker. She's chief tax counsel for legislation in treaties and international tax matters uh, for Jamaica's uh, tax administration. Uh, she's also a member of the Inclusive Framework Steering Group and a UN Tax Committee member. And we also have uh, Nana Akua Amoako Mensa. She is a legal officer and competent authority for exchange of information for the Ghana Revenue Authority. So very distinguished panel. Thank you again so much for spending your time with me and with us today. Uh, let me lead off now with a quick question for, well, maybe not quick question. I'm sure the answer is very, very, uh, very, it's going to be very thorough. Uh, let me ask, uh, turn to Marlene, uh, you know, what can be done to cultivate and support the personal development uh, of negotiators from developing countries? Um, Marlene, if you could start us off and maybe Amadou, you can follow up, please. Okay, um, well, thank you, Stephanie, and um, thanks to Martin and Tiffany for the presentation. I have to say that a lot of um, their research has um, borne out my own experience um, serving both in the uh, steering group as well as being um, a current member of the UN uh, Tax Committee. Um, to be to be honest, uh, you don't know we don't normally think of us attending, um, you know the um, multilateral um, meetings, uh, the global forum of the IF as us being involved in negotiations. I never thought of it that way before until now, and um, the more I thought about it and the more I re I re reflect on the past 10 years being in, involved in, in, in that forum, I realized that that is precisely what um, we are involved in. Typically, you think of it as being in the bilateral process. Uh, in the multilateral process, however, um, things are, 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 are very different because you end up having to sometimes negotiate around policy issues. And um, for developing countries who do not have the kind of experience in um in negotiations um typically what uh, may happen is that you may have uh one or two persons within the tax authority who may be focused on international um taxation in 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 jamaica um I, I, I lead that unit. We have um, five attorneys, including myself, and then we work closely with a group of um, technical specialists. But Jamaica also has a very small treaty network, and our own engagement with the international uh, tax community uh, just started perhaps about 10 years ago. And so the issue of capacity building is, is very important. And um, I believe that um, the ATAF model. I think is one that um, could be modified, uh, certainly for my region, which is a CARICOM region, because I know that um, the issues that we have in engaging is also um, experienced by other members of the, of the CARICOM community. And I'm thinking that perhaps the ATAF model where you actually have a, um, an expert who is assigned um, from the OECD and the um, experts from the African region who are um, part of ATAF, who work with ATAF and, and who are guided um, by the, the, the input from, from the expert from the OECD. What that allows them to do is to be able to 
um, develop not only um, the, the expertise or, and also to develop um, technical papers and so on, it also allows them to be able to, um, to, to disseminate the information of the, to the ATAF members. And because the, the process that is used at the um, OECD can be very intimidating you are given highly complex technical papers a short time within which to um to digest the information and there is nobody to to guide you as to um precisely how to process this information and so i think that that um, for example, regional collaboration and adoption of that model, which helps to build capacity. It also helps to um, to disseminate information to the um, political um, the, the political class as well, who um, are not at the G20 table, but who nevertheless are expected to make uh, decisions on highly complex matters. And so, I think that that there can be some modification of of that within our region. There are um, courses, of course, you know, the UN has courses and that sort of thing um, that persons can go on. But I think for um, small um, jurisdictions, how they can approach it is to select a group of persons who you invest in and, um, and to have continuing education because you may not have the practical um, experience because, you know, it depends on, um, you know, your your, your involvement, but, um, or, or um, you may not be able to attend all of the meetings, but as far as possible to develop a group of experts within your own jurisdiction. Thank you so much, Marlene. Uh, you know, it's so funny when I'm listening to you speak, I sort of think of how journalists also have to deal with, you know, these ma massive um, you know, reports and, and, and uh, guidance and everything. And it's, I, it's, it's mind boggling, just, just all that information. It's, it's, I can understand. <laughs> Trust me, I can understand what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, so um, Amadou, I would like to ask you the same question. You know, what, what can be done to support the personal development of negotiators? Thank you, Stephanie. And I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate Martin and Tovini on an excellent piece of work. I think they have identified all the main problems faced by countries, especially developing countries, in international forums. Before I continue, I'd just like to make a small correction. I'm not the Director General. I'm the Director of Legislation and International Cooperation. And I've been the head of the negotiating team for Senegal for the last seven or eight years, just to make that clarification. Okay, I think it's an excellent question. And my friend Marlene, with whom I am from time to time at meetings of the steering group of the Inclusive Framework, has given an excellent explanation of the problems that we all live with. I think they need to be addressed at two levels. So the first level is internal. I think that if our own countries take note of what is at stake in international tax, if I take the example of Senegal, we have just two offices with two people. I have been there seven years as director of international cooperation and I've had four heads of unit who have moved on. So I'm on my fourth head of unit in four years. Can you imagine? We don't have the time to develop the expertise necessary to follow these matters effectively. That is a big problem. Our states need to understand what is at stake. Let me take the example of the MLI. The MLI is a good thing for our countries to protect a little bit of our tax base. But, you see, few countries are engaging with the MLI. If I take the African region, few West African countries are members of the IF. This is a problem linked to the lack of political awareness of the international tax questions. So this is the first thing we need to do, to reinforce our international tax units, give them the human and logistical resources, if not, that will continue to be a problem. The second problem 
is the international level. We must welcome the work of ATAF and the OECD as well, who do a lot of work. But I think Martin and Tovini have underlined that we often need preparation meetings on the eve of the big meetings. We don't have the time to digest all the documents and things are going very fast. We can't participate effectively in those meetings and influence the decisions. So that is important. We need coordination. I would love us to have an African expertise on these questions, for example, on digital, so that we can be proactive, reflect beforehand and influence things well in advance. Often, what happens is that we are reactive. I think in these matters, we should, shouldn't be reactive. We need to be proactive. So of the two points I wanted to emphasize, the second is to create an expertise that ATAF is trying to create, but to go much further in terms of being reactive, but also propositional. Those were the two points I wanted to emphasize, Stephanie. And thanks again to the two presenters, Tovini and Martin. Thank you very much, Amadou, and uh, apologies for your for getting your uh, title wrong. Um, I appreciate your intervention, and uh, I, I I wish you all luck uh, with the future negotiations. Uh, so let me now turn to um, Nana. Uh, how can developing countries join and pool their efforts to leverage their strength in numbers in these negotiations? Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I also wanted to just give a quick um, thank you to Martin, Rasmus, and Tovani for the work they did on the paper. It's been a very insightful read, and I think it expresses a lot of the things that um, I have as personal views. Um, in particular, when it comes to um, the area of South-to-South -South cooperation and developing capacity of the lower-income countries primarily, even before they contribute to organizations such as the Inclusive Framework. I think that to get to the point where the level playing field is actually level and that um, an equal seat is means the same as having an equal voice, it means that the lower income countries have to have the same level of capacity and the to make meaningful contributions at these um, um, in these fora and, and also to have meaningful impact in these fora. Um, you find that countries like Ghana, for example, we do a lot of our uh, uh, influence or a lot of our negotiations or a lot of our work in the international forum through bodies like ATAF and the G24 because those are very fertile grounds for you know thinking through policies and coming up with that work best for countries that are just like us and are in similar positions and have faced similar experiences and have similar resources and challenges. And, um, and we, so far we see it as effective and we see it as working for us and we feel that we actually make more of an impact as a, an observer through these groups at the inclusive framework and, and things like that than being a member directly. Um, so I, I think it's key to, to work together as lower income jurisdictions build similar levels of capacity, expound on policies and significant natures and similar challenges, and then come as a group to these international fora, because that helps develop um, a more comprehensive debate and comprehensive conversation on any particular issue when you know where you're coming from. And you've been able to expound on these and develop capacity in these forms before you even come to the larger group. Whereas if you come on your own, sometimes there's um, you're not able to even form a complete and comprehensive view because then there's so much um, opposing views and viewpoints that don't take into consideration your priorities. Um, um, but these are this are kind of the thoughts. I find a lot of them are reflected in the research that um, um, was put into the working paper here and and. And it also highlights a lot of beneficial, um, how do you call it, attributes of working in the international forum, or keeping in track with the international forum, which I think we should consider too as we work in our local blocks. So um, 
I think these are primarily my viewpoints on this end. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk. Of course, thank you so much. Yes, I mean, you know, multilateralism, I think it's, it's so uh, important these days, especially, you know, with this pandemic has really shown, you know, cooperation is really um, important and crucial for progress. So uh, thank you very much, Nana, for your, your intervention there. Um, so let me now turn to Emmanuel and Kim, hello. Uh, so let me ask you, what do you think is possible then for developing countries to achieve uh, through the inclusive framework and through other global and regional me uh, cooperation mechanisms? Um, perhaps, uh, Emmanuel, you can start us off. All right, thank you very much, um, Stephanie. Thank you also to the panel for all the good work they have done presenting the research. From my experience as a tax negotiator for Nigeria and the current head of international tax policy development for my country, uh, my most of the issues raised in the research are part of the experience we have in the field. I also say that having represented Nigeria in Working Party 1, Working Party 6, and Working Party 11, and also attending ATAP CBT. Um, what have we achieved in our engagement in international tax discussions and the push for reforms? Well, I, I would say that we are definitely not where we want to be, but it is certain we are not where we used to be. Our achievements have been modest and incremental, and most of them goes to the protection of our domestic tax base from erosion from, from busy erosion by multinational enterprises. The, the, question, the question can also be approached in a different way. By looking at where we were before this sustained engagement and where we are presently, prior to most of this engagement by developing countries, we were not invited to the discussion at all. That's to say, in the, world, in the term uh, going into an accord as the term of this engagement, that we were off the table and then abundantly in the menu. That was the situation. When we were invited, we had little or no skills to engage effectively. And then when we had little skills, we had no strategy, no objective, no dedicated negotiators and all that. Adding to that, we were also not talking to each other. We were not collaborating as, as developing countries. Now, after several years of engagement, where are we? We are at a level where I can tell you Nigeria, for instance, attended all the Working Party 1 meetings as it relates to the ongoing work. The same with Working Party 6 and Working Party 11 for the year 2020, irrespective of all the challenges, the COVID challenges and all. We attended all the meetings, contributed technical papers, and made fiscal representations. We are also at a level where we are self-developing trying to build capacity for ourselves. We are also at a level where we are engaging multinational agencies to help build capacity for us and other less income, less, uh, less developed countries. Then you can see examples of this in, in the work being done by OECD in using KSP. You can also see it in the various technical assistance coming our way that developing countries. Example is tax inspectors without borders. Then we are also at a level where we have started seeing collaboration, collaboration at regional level, collaboration at continental level. At regional level, you can talk of uh, association like WATAF. You also talk of association like ATAF at the continental level. We have been able to use ATAF as an aggregator of views from countries, both the ones that belong to IF and the ones that are not in IF. We have continue to also make sure that ITAF is relevant in all discussions globally on tax matters, not just as, a, as, as an observer, but more, more so as, an, as, as a participant, active participant. Then at, 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 a continent, at a global level, we are active participants in the G20 moves, trying to implement policies that favor us in, in the ongoing work, both at UN or at, at OECD inclusive framework. Then, these issues are important because we, we, do, we believe that for us to make the needed move, the needed, uh, get the needed result, we need to talk to each other, we need to engage with each other, and we also need to know what we are talking when we go to the meetings. 
because that's the only way through which we can engage the high income countries. Now, having said all this, speaking more specifically to issues, to the influences that we have had, I could tell you that the issues that relate to mandatory binding arbitrations, we have continued to hold the line for developing nations because we know at the end it will not bode well for, for us if, if we allow that to go in. Martin, in his research, spoke about uh, the, the, the TBC Act. Yes, we do not start it, but we are championing it because we think it is relevant. We think it is important for developing nations. The reason why most of us are not assessing the report today is not because we are not interested. It's primarily because the cost of assessing it is very high. The infrastructure you have to put in place, most of the developing countries are unable to afford it. So we have continued to lead the line also in this, in this regard by pressing to inclusive framework for members that there is need to lower the threshold for developing, developing countries. There is also need to lower the, the, the financial threshold for reporting so that when we are able to assess, we assess that of MNEs that are doing businesses in our, in our, in our various jurisdictions, not just a few that meet the $750 million in euros threshold. So we did not initiate it as developing country, but we are championing it because we think it is important to us. There is a whole lot of other things that is going on. The jury is still out on, 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 the, imp uh, on the impact we have on the ongoing negotiation and taxation of digital economy. But I can assure you that when the, when the, when the reports come out or when the final work is, is, is out, you will see that Nigeria and other developing countries have tried to hold the line in ensuring that there's more state taxation, in ensuring that what we will have out of the whole project is better than what we presently have. So give or take, the challenges we are having remain the same. There's need to build capacity. There is need to, to simplify some of the, the technical policy document that are pushed to us at this level, at this various platform of engagement. There is also need to have even increased collaboration among ourselves, not just in the continent, but also outside the continent talking about the G, G24 and uh, the, the CIAT and other uh, pressure groups which may come in to aid us in the process. So primarily, this, these are my views about our influence. I believe that we have done well so far, but there is room to do better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That's really fascinating to hear um, Nigeria's journey. So I really appreciate your sharing your thoughts and in, uh, in the future. So thank you so much. Um, uh, Kim, let me ask you now. Um, so I know that Philippines is not a member of the um, inclusive framework. Uh, let me just ask you, just to start off, you know, could you just speak about your involvement in these negotiations um, at the well? Let's talk about global forum, um, and and on the inclusive framework. Um, you know, and why did Philippines decide against joining the inclusive framework, despite being you know active in initial discussions um, leading up to the creation of the framework? Yeah, actually, the Philippines was invited to participate in the start of the global forum based erosion profit shifting. And the Philippines, when I was the commissioner of the BIR, Bureau of Internal Revenue, we agreed to participate, provided we made it clear that since we don't have a vote in the discussion, but we were asked to just participate, we said that whatever has been decided upon should not be binding on the Philippines because we don't have a voice anyway, except for participating in that discussion. And the Philippines has been really active in that participation. And we sent people, I think most of our people were there every month, spending on travel, hotel, and all the discussion. Uh, why didn't we join the inclusive framework? Because first, I think the, the title is correct, no? because that's the problem we all developing country is facing, base erosion and profit shifting. However, the identification of the item below, right, this is the major problem, but the identification of the problem was not, was not to me, to us, applicable to a developing country. So, and uh, having spent so much, I think when we participated, we were hoping that uh, the problems that we are facing, we would be able to raise it and it will be taken, taken up. 
but unfortunately it was not taken up in the way that it that a developing country think that the proper identification of our problem and therefore because there's no proper identification of the problem facing the developing country the solution are not really applicable to a developing country now if you want to join the inclusive framework then you should agree to participate and to implement whatever was taken up right but since in our analysis having participated in it we believe that uh, first the identification of the details of the problem was not the way that the developing country is really facing it and therefore the solution is also not the right solution so why spend more money and give a commitment to something that is not applicable to what a developing country is facing. That's a reason why uh, the Philippines, why we recommend that, that the Philippines don't join the inclusive framework, despite all the work we have done and being very active in it. Uh, but having said that, I would like to say that that's all water under the bridge, right? So if the OECD is really saying that they want everyone to be in equal footing and that it's really going to be an inclusive framework, then I think going forward, rather than complain about what was wrong that they did in the past, I think going forward, if the OECD countries are really serious about and they are really sincere and not hypocritical about saying that they want to help the developing country achieve their SDG, then first they should really discuss with developing country, what is really your problem, right? And then really identify that problem and let's discuss what are the solutions that can be applied, right? And I think the solutions for developing country cannot be the same solution as a developed country. Because first, the developing country, uh, to us, the developing country is simple. We, there are business in, the, in their country and we need to, to because you're doing business in, in our country, then you should pay the taxes relating to your business activity in the country, right? Uh, it's as simple as that. And I think the other thing is maybe uh, OECD should, or, or the global community should think out of the box, right? Because if you look at the problem, it's the problem is not double taxation. The problem is how do you make people pay taxes in the country? So we're not no longer really concerned about double taxation. Uh, maybe there should be a rethink about the double taxation treaty. I don't have any quarrel about tax exchange information agreement, right? Because to, for, to make people honest, you have to be transparent. And I agree that DEIA, DEIA is a way of making people and business transparent and accountable. But I think there should be a rethink whether with the way things are going on and with digitalization whether double taxation treaty is still relevant and with the way the mne conduct themselves whether we should rethink about having double taxation treaty in fact right and and to me taxation is also a sovereignty issue right so if you do business in a country, then you should follow the law of that country. So why should that country give up their jurisdiction or their sovereignty over a certain issue just because it's an MNE? So those are one of the re part of the reasons why uh, we did not recommend joining the inclusive framework. But if there's a change of philosophy, and there's really a sincere desire to hear the voice of the developing country and a sincere desire to listen to how the developing country think the solution should be. And I'm sure the Philippines can rethink, rethink its position and join the inclusive framework. Thanks so much, Kim. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, it's fascinating to report on the evolution 
of the OECD as a tax making body, uh, tax making tax setting, uh, st tax standard setting body, um, just because you know it's, it has it, its um, it, its membership has really in, increased over the past five years. I mean, inclusive framework we have to all remember it's only and it's really in its infancy. It's five years. You know, it's basically a toddler. Um, and so I mean, it's it's basically it's it's going to have to grow and and, and change um, just and learn lessons from what everyone's how, what everyone's talking about today, and you know build on experiences. So it's it's been very fascinating. Um, thank you so much for sharing uh, a Philippines experience, Kim. Uh, so now let me just turn to uh, so we've got a lot of questions coming in now from the audience. So let me. Um, pose a couple questions to all of you, all of my panelists today. Um, first, uh, we have Eric Faring, uh, who's in the audience, and he's asking, uh, what could the implications for development partners who support the OECD's work on tax and development, uh, including their efforts to make the IF more inclusive? So wh what do you think, uh, what should development partners be doing to support this work um, and uh, you know, make I inclusivity um, very meaningful in the inclusive framework. Uh, I, can I? I think the development partner should the multilaterals. I, I think he's talking about the World Bank, IMF, right? The UN. I think first they should probably organize the developing country and and synthesize what is really the problem. And, re and get from the developing country what are the possible solutions. Because uh, basically UN said all of you should target and should achieve to stay SDG goals, right? So in order to achieve that, you should equip the developing co the countries on how to raise revenue, how to implement it, right? So I think the first thing is really to uh, gather the developing countries and find out what's the, the real problem and what is the real solution that they think that should be adopted. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Emmanuel, you wanted to weigh in? No, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for development partners, um, it's clear to me how they could support uh, developing countries to achieve more in the on ongoing work in the inclusive framework. One of it goes to some one issue that I've already pointed out, capacity building. You do not, you cannot solve your problem when you are unable to identify what your problem is in the first place. You know, question has been raised that developing countries are now on the table. Are we on the table as dinner or the diner. That's another level of uh, uh, the, the, the rhetoric. So you find out that without capacity, we could be on the table as the dinner, not the diner. So we, we takes us back to, to square one. So there's need for a continual uh, personal capacity development, especially in the area of international tax. And again, some of our colleagues, especially in Africa, we find out that um, uh, resources, uh, financial resources is a big issue. They are actually a stop from attending this meeting. Uh, I come from Nigeria and I know which time I go to Paris to attend these meetings, I know how much I spend. Some of our countries in Africa cannot afford that. So if there is a kind of funding around uh, being able to get them attend these meetings, uh, that, that will also go a long way to help. Then there should continue also to be a campaign, campaign to the high income countries. Because our experience at the negotiation table is that most times everybody comes talk to their own point of view. But the truth is, if we have to achieve anything, uh, uh, we have to achieve the big picture. We all have to give, give some things, especially those who are having so much now, they have to let some things go. More so because the COVID-19 that we have this year have shown us that a problem in a remote area in Africa can quickly become a problem for somebody living in a developed world. So if you insist on your guns, because they are getting more of the revenue now, you insist on having the, uh, more than your fair share, you deprive developing countries resources to fight diseases, resources to prevent these diseases. If they do come, we are not a global <laughs> village it will definitely go back to effective if it is not controlled from the source. So this campaign is important to bring it to them, 
that while they go into this negotiation, they shouldn't just think from prisoner and, and selfish prison. They should also look at the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And uh, Nana, you wanted to also weigh in and then Marlene? Thank you. Um, I actually just kind of want to reiterate what Kim and Emmanuel have said. Um, um, basically, that what, do, what can development partners do? Mm -hmm. Resources. Um, one of the major challenges that um, lower income jurisdictions face in effectively, you know, participating or collaborating is lack of resources and lack of capacity. And how do we do this? How do we build this up? Because um, Emmanuel just put it very, very clearly, COVID has highlighted this more than ever, that globalization has emphasized the fact that we all we are all neighbors and it's not enough to ignore what's happening in an, another part of the world and think that it will never affect you. It will affect you at some point in time. So if we don't come up with solutions or international policies that work best for everybody in some, in some way, everybody has to compromise, everybody has to give something up and so that others can gain, so that they gain something in return. So to get that kind of framework and to reach that kind of level of policy and discussion that will be in-depth and effectual and efficient, you need to build up the capacity and the resources of the lower income countries. And you do that by funding trainings, by, by, by providing a space and, and, and and supporting bodies that would allow them to have discussions and come up with policy ideas on their own and build capacity and 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 work through challenges that may not occur to you not because you you are not you are not in that position so you can never think for them they have to be able to or we have to be able to get the space to discuss with ourselves and come up with policies um Emmanuel has highlighted a lot of the things that Nigeria has been doing in the international forum pushing ideas that work really well for lower income countries. Imagine if Nigeria had the chance to talk to Ghana and talk to um, all the ATAF countries and all the, ca the Caribbean countries have, which have very similar you know, uh, viewpoints and challenges. And we were able to you know, come up with a solid plan that works well. And then we come as a block to the inclusive framework to argue this out or debate this and bring it out. I think the conversation would be very, very different, but very, very beneficial. And so um, it's important that um, development partners recognize this and, and work towards bringing everybody up to the same level so that we can actually have equitable equality. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, where when we say you're equal, it means you're coming with the same power, the same voice, the same um, impact, you know, and, and, and it leads to a fruitful and beautiful discussion, I think. Um, so I basically just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I just, I just want to quickly respond to something I saw in the chat from um, ATAF. Uh, just to clarify that, um, I don't know if I was the one who made a statement about the OECD involvement in ATAF. What I, the point I was making is that they have an expert from the OECD who works with their experts in ATAF. It's not that they are the ones, the OECD influences ATAF or they were involved in the establishment of it. So I just wanted to clarify that. But, um, but I, I also want to, um, to agree with Nana and, and Emmanuel and, and Kim uh, regarding the involvement of the partners, the World Bank, the multilaterals um, overall. And it's interesting because yesterday um, I was part of a panel um, for the platform on, on collaboration of tax where all of those multilaterals um, are, are partnering to deal with um, these these. Um, these global tax issues. And I think that um, how they can assist, particularly in the region, um, is by helping all, we have a regional body, CARICOM, and, but currently issues such as trade, um, trade is treated um, by a different unit of CARICOM as opposed to fiscal concerns, as, a, as opposed to, um, you know, other economic um, concerns. I think for a small region, I think how the, um, the multilaterals can assist is by helping CARICOM to somehow uh, coordinate all of those issues under one umbrella. It's a small region, but these are interlocking inter, um, um, areas. And so perhaps we can using a modification of the ATAF model, build a team of experts 
um, have some um, some kind of cohesiveness because it's a small um, region, but have some kind of cohesiveness and that will help um, countries in the region, I think, to also be able to discuss policy um, issues. Most of us in the region don't have an international tax policy issue. Um, a lot of what we agree on is not enshrined in domestic law. And, um, and so I think that we can modify the ATAF model, get a group of experts together within the CARICOM region that are able to discuss these um, issues. We can utilize experts from the World Bank, from the IMF, from the OECD, from the UN, who can also uh, work along with our experts um, in that regard. Great, thank you so much, Marlene. Um, this is a, all, all, all really good insight. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so uh, Amadou, I wanted to ask, uh, we have one question here from Philip Baker, and actually it's a question I, I was very curious about. Um, you know, how has the remote, the use of remote, you know, internet-based attendance at, for, um, at meetings of the inclusive framework during COVID, um, has, it, has it made it easier for participants from developing countries um, to, you know, to really uh, eff effectively participate in the meetings? Um, wh what are your thoughts on that? Sh should it continue as well after the pandemic? Uh, Amadi? Yep. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. There's something good about the pandemic. If I take my example, I used to go to Paris to represent Senegal, my country, uh, at uh, OECD meetings. It was a lot of our resources. But when I think about the Zoom meetings, we can have more representations and more flexibility. In my opinion, I think there's something good about it. If we take the training we used to do in the past, today we don't have to move to another area and we have a lot of people joining um, in our meeting. And so, so it's very good. So that's very key. But, but allow me instead to, me to come back onto the previous question I would just make an advocacy for African regions for thanks to come back to ETAF to for ETAF to take leadership in terms of capacity building pertaining to all supportive organizations. So we so also the World Bank and the IMF, uh, the international um, uh, organization must go through, must go through the attack, attack that knows the African needs. It's a problem of coordination of these needs and also the management of these African needs in terms of tax. So I want to take advantage of this microphone to say that I want the ATAP to take the leadership and also for the capacity building. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amadou, for that intervention. Uh, we have just about five minutes left, and um, I just wanted to pose you know, just one general question to all of you um, very quick, quickly. Um, could you just, just describe the future of multilateralism in one word? Um, can we all do that? <laughs> so take a minute and uh, let me know. Uh, what, what do you think is the future of multilateralism? One word. Un mot, s'il vous plaît. D'accord. I think multilateralism it has a good and brilliant and bright future. And uh, that's the, the, the future of the world. Uh, bien, the world it's the future of the world. <laughs> uh, Marlene. Yes. Yeah. Um, One word. <laughs> necessary. 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 Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, Nana, what would you think? I would say exciting. Exciting. I like that. <laughs> uh, uh, Emmanuel? Evolving. Evolving ah, to the extent that excellent. Yeah, we, we, what we have now is not sustainable. And um, the, the, the eventually, the world will see a need that you need to evolve to be more encompassing, to be more equitable, 
and to be more effective. So I believe it will evolve. Yes. Okay, excellent. And Kim, last word. Hard work. <laughs> <laughs> hard work. Very, very good. And I'm sure the hard work will continue. I'm sure there's, there's, there's definitely plenty to work on in the future. So ma many thanks again to all of you, all my panelists. You've been fabulous. And uh, many thanks to the audience and for um, Martin and Tovani for your great research and Mar Rasmus as well um, the, and the ICTD. Thank you so much for inviting me to moderate. Um, and I will pass the floor back to uh, Martin, I believe. Thank you again. Thanks, Stephanie. There's not really much else to say. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending and to the, the panelists. Um, uh, you know, the, the fact that we can have all of these different people on the same call speaking is, uh, and the fact that things have changed in that way over the, the last year really is, I guess, a, a, a silver lining to the difficult time we've had this year. Um, so uh, uh, thanks to everybody. Please, uh, uh, it, the, the working paper is a little bit long and it's been quite hard to condense it down for this uh, session. So please do go and download it from the website and read it um, and it'll get much more detail in there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again at future ICTD events. Thanks. <laughs>